Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It's time to ignite the flames of revival with 3ABN's first interactive homecoming camp meeting. It's time to rise and shine. We are the light of the world. Turn up the light, let it shine bright like never before. In a world that's dark, the only hope we have is Jesus Christ. So turn up the light, let it shine bright. Turn up, turn up the light. Hello, 3ABN Homecoming continues on 3ABN. And we are glad that you are with us because we have a wonderful time of studying God's Word. During this hour, you will hear a message from God's Word that has a very interesting title, A Bright Light, Midnight Delight. Our speaker for this hour is Pastor Ryan Day. Not a stranger to most of you, but for those of you that do not know him, he has been an evangelist for several years has preached not only across the United States, but in other countries as well. His passion is to preach God's Word with a prayer in his heart that you will accept Jesus Christ and be prepared for the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I encourage you to get your Bibles in whatever form you have it, uh, whether it be on a physical Bible or a tablet, whatever it may be, but follow along. You may want to find something to write things down or even... Record this message because you will want to hear it again. It's a study that will help you prepare for Christ's soon return. But before Pastor uh, Ryan Day speaks, we have a musical offering for us. And we have Pastor John Lomacang that will be singing a message in song that is entitled, I Must Tell Jesus. We thank the Lord that we also have Brother Tim Parton accompanying on piano. May God bless each and every one of us. must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my troubles quickly. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, oh Jesus can help me, yes Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 
Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor and Brother Tim Parton. It's always a blessing to hear their music. It always blesses my heart, and I know it blesses you as well. I must tell Jesus, and that's what it's all about. In these last days, we need to be preparing to tell the gospel to the world and tell people about our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so excited about today's message uh, because, well, it's a special one. It's a present truth message for our time. And as you heard before, the title is A Bright Light Midnight Delight. <laughs> it's a mouthful, A Bright Light Midnight Delight. Uh, but you will see in just a little while exactly what we mean by A Bright Light Midnight Delight. Before we go any further, though, I would like to go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to lead and guide me by the power of His Spirit and to also be with you uh, so that you may receive the words of the Lord now. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so thankful, Lord. And we're so gracious, Lord, that you have received your people, that you are preparing a people, Lord, in these last days for your kingdom. And Lord, the message that we are about to dive into, you know, Lord, that I cannot and dare not approach this message on my own, but I need spiritual eyesight. I need, Lord, the spiritual hearing, the spiritual mind of Jesus to be able to rightly divide your word at this moment. Lord, I pray that you will amplify this message to the viewers, that you will prick my heart, that you will prick their hearts, and that you will draw us closer to Jesus Christ. Father, pour out your spirit upon us now. Clothe us in your love and lead us to see clearly and to comprehend your truth for these last days. We praise you, and we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. In April of 1775, the colonial residents of the state of Massachusetts had heard uh, that there might just be a planned attack by the British Redcoats. And of course, uh, a gentleman by the name of Paul Revere would again receive this message and some of his friends, John Hancock and uh, a few others came together and they decided that they were going to create a system that if indeed there was going to be some type of invasion or some type of attack on uh, these, this colony of Massachusetts, that uh, they had planned very particularly exactly how they would bring about a warning system so that the local residents of the cities of Concord and Lexington would be aware uh, that the British were coming. And so they devised a system. Right there in the North Church in Boston, Massachusetts, Paul Revere had asked that as he would plan to ride across the bay of the Charleston River or the Charles River, uh, he would wait across the bay there and he would look towards the belfry and the tower of the North Church there in Boston. And they had devised a system that if there was one lantern hanging in that belfry tower, that meant that the British were coming by land. And of course, if there were two lanterns hanging in the tower, that meant that they were coming by sea. And of course, it happened that around midnight, Paul Revere, looking across the bay, he saw the tower and he did indeed see two hanging lanterns signifying that the British were going to attack Lexington and Concord by sea. And so Paul Revere took his horse and he went about his famous midnight ride, riding from community to community, from home to home, yelling and screaming atop from his horse Notice, many people think he said, the British are coming, the British are coming, but that's actually not what he said. You see, there were many loyalists in these colonies, still very much loyal to the British crown. And so actually, if you do some research, or screaming from the top of his horse, he said, the regulars are coming out, the regulars are coming out. And he rode from town to town, from city to city, community to community, screaming atop, the regulars are coming out, the regulars are coming out, warning men who were on standby as they would arise from their sleep and they would grab their guns of defense and they would go out to defend their colony that evening or that night. All of this happening, notice, around the time of midnight. It's very interesting that we also, in the Bible, have a warning. Jesus has sent us warnings that the world will come to a quick end. 
and that Jesus is soon to come to deliver His saints who are at war with the enemy. And so, my friends, I would like to draw your attention to the Bible at this moment. We're going to go to Mark chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 35 through 37. Notice what the Bible says. Again, Jesus' words. He says, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. I love those words because Jesus is communicating a sense of urgency. Notice how he says that you do not know what hour the master will return. You see, we can indeed have an assurance of salvation. We should have an assurance of salvation to know that Jesus Christ is our Savior so that we can be ready at any time that He is to come. But He does remind us that there will be no warning in the sense that when He actually arrives, you must be ready because warnings have already been given by this point. That's why He goes on to say, watch, keep watching. And of course, we're not going to apply a literal watching to this. We know that Jesus is not asking us to go out to the sky and just stare up 24-7, just gawking at the skies, watching to see if He's going to come. That word watch there simply means to be prepared, be aware, be watching and, and be able to discern the signs of the times so that you know what is happening, you know what is coming, so that when Jesus does indeed come, even though you don't know the day nor the hour, it will not catch you off guard. In fact, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to communicate these same words, this same idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. Notice what the Bible says. Again, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 and then we're going to kind of recap as to what this passage is saying to us. Notice what Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. He says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, I love that. And sons of day, you are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, there it is again, watch and be sober. This passage is powerful because it reminds us that again, as Paul says, look, I don't really need to write to you about this. Why would he use that language? Because this message, my friends, is to the church. This is to the church at Thessalonica. Those Christians had been prepared. They had been taught. They had been preached to by Paul off, off and on, off and on, all the time about the coming of the Lord. And so he's telling them, look, there's no need for me to even write to you about the signs and the seasons and all these things or the times and the seasons because you know more than anyone that Jesus Christ's coming will be like a thief in the night. And I, I, it's interesting that he goes on to say uh, there's two different groups of people. There's you, speaking of the church, and then there's they. Okay, there's they. They are, the pre, are those that are not necessarily in relationship with Jesus. They do not know Jesus as their personal Savior. And so he says, for they, speaking of that second group, when they say peace and safety, my friends, we're living, we have seen more than anything, any time, anything before us. We have seen recently that the world has been living in a state of peace and safety in the sense that they were not prepared. They are not ready for what was to come. And living in these COVID times as we have been, we have seen very clearly that anything can happen in a moment at any time that would change the world forever. I remember just a few months ago, as the world seemed to be living in a state of somewhat peace and safety, until it seemed like our world changed overnight with a pandemic that would rock this world, followed by violent protests and riots and, and all kinds of angry actions and things that was taking a place all across the major cities of this nation. We have been living in what might, some might consider troublesome times. 
But what Paul is talking about here under the guidance and leadership of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily the times that we're living in right now. No, this is a precursor to something even greater. He's saying there's coming a time when people are going to say, oh, peace and safety, everything's okay. Life is just going on as normal. We're just going to live life to the fullest. We're not going to worry about tomorrow. And, of course, he says, uh, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Notice he says, as labor pains. And right there in the Greek, as labor pains, it's the Greek word odin, odin. And it's the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, when Jesus is talking and referring to the signs of the times that were to be a precursor to the second coming of Jesus. He said, and all of these are the beginning of sorrows. That word sorrows there, odin, same word Paul uses here when he describes labor pains. It would be as as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall, and notice this, in in English it says they shall not escape, but Paul wanted to really, really, really nail this down. He wanted to really emphasize the seriousness and the urgency of this message because he used a double negative. Paul was a very educated man, but he used a double negative in the Greek here. It's the Greek word ume. He says, and they shall no, not escape. I don't think anyone would deny the fact that we have been living in dark times. And anyone with half sense can look around and see what's going on and know that we are living in the time of the end. We are fast approaching the very end of time. It is up to you and I, as the Bible has clearly told us to be watchful, to be aware, to be able to have the spiritual eyesight of Christ, the spiritual faith of Jesus, so that we can discern the times that we are living in, so we can make sure that we are a bright light, midnight delight. You may still be wondering what that means. Let's continue on in our study. Probably out of all of the teachings of Jesus, out of all of the parables that Jesus gave, The one that we're about to study is one that I study often. I use often in my sermons. I use often in my Bible studies. Because while I want to make it very clear that all the teachings of Jesus and all the parables of Jesus are very, very important for our time, there seems to be one that sticks out to me more than any other. Because it is a present truth prophetic parable. It's a present truth prophetic parable that is, that is used by Jesus to show us and to prepare us and to help inform us about the times that we are living in. Of course, the parable that I'm referring to is none other than the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew chapter 25. If we can go there now in our Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 25 And we're going to slowly walk through this parable. My friends, again, I just want to remind you, this is not just a short story that Jesus is using to teach a moral lesson. This is prophetic in nature. You're going to see that this this parable, while it's not necessarily more important than any of the other parables, it's very much a present truth parable, a message for our time. And we need to comprehend what it is saying for us to be that bright light, midnight of delight uh, for Jesus Christ. And we'll come back to that again in just a moment. So notice Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to pause and recap what it is that we have read. The Bible says here in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. Just want to make that point there very clear. All of them, the wise and the foolish, at some point prior to this great midnight cry that we're about to read about, they all are found slumbering and sleeping. I'm afraid we've probably been doing a little bit of that here lately. But my friends, something is coming and God is about to blow the trumpet. He's about to sound the alarm. He's about to give a cry indeed in the midnight of despair that we find ourselves in to awaken us to his soon arrival. 
There are a lot of symbols in this parable. Before we go any further, we have to make sure that we understand what it's talking about. There may be someone at home right now that has never heard this message before, and they're wondering, well, if it's prophetic, and, and you know, what do these things mean? We're going to allow the Bible to interpret itself. First of all, you'll notice that you have ten virgins. You'll notice that these ten virgins, well, they're women, obviously, and we know that in the Bible we can be assured that a woman represents, in Bible prophecy, a church. Uh, a good text that reminds us of this, of course, there's one in Jeremiah that tells us that, you know, I've likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Uh, of course, the daughter of Zion being the church, God's people. But I like this one in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, because Paul actually uses the language virgin, referring to the church at Corinth that he was leading and guiding and teaching to prepare for Jesus' soon return. Notice the language he used, referring to the church. He says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Again, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. So these 10 virgins, my friends, we're talking about the church. All right, let's focus in and hone in our attention on just that. We're talking about the church. So when we see these 10 virgins, notice both wise and foolish, we're talking about God's church. These, these individuals who profess to believe in Jesus Christ, who profess and place their faith and their allegiance in Jesus Christ. So we're going to come back to that. Let's look at the second symbol. It says that these bridegrooms, they took, a, or excuse me, the virgins took up their lamps, right? They've got their lamps with them. What do these lamps represent, okay? We don't have to go very far to know what that represents. That famous verse in Psalm chapter 119, 105, the Bible tells us, Your word, I love this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So oftentimes the Bible uh, in Scripture or the Word of God in Scripture is likened into a lamp or a light for our path. It is indeed that. When we are studying and reading and, and comprehending and, 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 and taking in the Word of God on a daily basis, we are, we are growing in the light of Jesus. Jesus is shining His bright, righteous light in our paths so that we can indeed be prepared for the soon coming of Jesus. So the Bible is the lamp. It's very, very important that we understand, my friends, that these virgins, the church, God's church, they've got their lamps, and notice it says they're going out to meet the, the bridegroom. Okay, we don't have to go very far to know who the bridegroom is. Uh, Jesus Christ is indeed the bridegroom, and we are his bride. We are the bride of Christ, so he is the bridegroom. So they've got their lamps. They've got the word of God, and they're going out. They're, they're professing their faith in Jesus. They're professing their faith in the word of God as they're going out to meet the bridegroom and to prepare for Jesus to come back and gather his people. So in faith, in faith in the word of God, in faith in the coming bridegroom, they're going out to meet Jesus Christ. Uh, but it also says in that previous passage that uh, they had these five foolish virgins, they had their lamps, but they took no oil with them. What does the oil represent? Now, I'm just going to give some references here for the lack of time. I'm not going to go to these passages, but I want to reference here. If you go to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Again, that's Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. And also Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. You will note there, if you pair these passages together as well as others, the symbolism of oil is often likened unto the Holy Spirit, okay? So let's put all of this together. We have the bridegroom, okay? It's Jesus Christ, and he's on his way, right? He's not come yet, but he's on his way. And the church, these virgins, there's, there's these five wives and these five foolish, they're all going out with their lamps, with the word of God, with their trust and their faith in God's word, that when it says in God's word and promises them that Jesus Christ Christ is going to come back for them. They believe in it. They see it. And they're going out together. And they're going and preparing to meet the bridegroom. The only difference is the five wives, wives has taken vessels full of oil. But the five foolish virgins, they have their lamp, but they had brought no extra oil with them. Notice what the scripture continues to say. Matthew chapter 25, verse 6. It says, And at midnight... A cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now this 
is a point, a powerful point. I just want to pause here and make this point very clear. So why are they arising? Because they were sleeping, all of them, okay? But now that the midnight cry has went out, this is a warning sound. This is a declaration that Jesus is on his way. Notice, he's not showed up yet, but he's on his way. That time of probation closing, it is on its way, but it's not here yet. But they've been receiving, at this point, a warning. And the warning is, arise, get up, get ready. Jesus is on his way. And notice what it says here. It says, and all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now, this is where I brought a little bit of an illustration with me. I'm very, very uh, lucky to have uh, a couple of illustrations or, or models of what these lamps might have looked like during this time. Actually, the ones that were given, these were given to me by a friend in Gentry, Arkansas, uh, at the Gentry Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I have a couple of different looking lamps here that actually predate the time of Jesus. I, uh, when, when these lamps were given to me, the uh, research that was given to me also was that these come from about the 4th and 5th century B.C. So these are very, very old lamps. But this is what the lamps might have looked like during the time of Jesus. As you can see, this, they're both from the Byzantine time period, and they're very old. In fact, I get kind of nervous and shaky when I'm holding them because <laughs> they feel so delicate because they're very old. Uh, but it's interesting that they would, of course, I don't have the wick here, uh, but as you can see in this one here, the wick would come from this part and kind of drape out of this little hole here, and they would put oil in here. Of course, the wick would be in here with the oil, and it would be soaking in that oil, and as they would bring the wick up, and the same thing with this one, they would put oil in the little vessel right here, and uh, these, these little small lamps here, but again, they would have the oil in here, but the wick would come out. Now, notice it says that they trimmed their lamps. They trimmed their lamps. Why? Did they immediately rise to trim their lamps? If, you have, if you've ever owned or, or have used a, a, a wick, a lamp with a wick, like an old oil lamp, then you know it's good to trim the wick. If you don't trim the wick and you try to light it, the, the light can get a little dim. So as they're awaking out of their slumber, they notice that their lights were a little dim, okay? And in the case of the five foolish, I could imagine their lights probably had went completely out, but the lights were very dim. When you trim that wick just right the, and you light it, the light gets brighter so you can be able to see better. Again, I love the camp meeting theme, you know, turn up the light. Some of us have oil in the lamp, but we haven't trimmed the wick. My friends, we need to trim the wick so that our lights can get brighter because we're living in dark times. But I, I love this because it, it teaches us, my friends, that even though we have a light, we need to make sure that our lights are shining as bright as they can. And so in the case of the five foolish virgins, they've got their lamps. They may have even had a little bit of oil as they went out and they were preparing to meet the bridegroom, but in the process of sleeping, that oil got used up, that wick was all burnt and singed, and as they went to trim their wicks, as they went to trim their lamps, they noticed, uh-oh, we don't have enough oil. So uh, notice what the Bible continues to say in Matthew chapter 25, verse 8. It says, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And I'd just like to make a good point here. Some of us may be of a mindset that somehow, some way, we can go to other sources, maybe even our brethren, to get a little bit of that Holy Spirit, right? And I just want to make this very clear. Can we get the Holy Spirit from others? I can hear you screaming from home right now. No, we can't get the Holy Spirit from others. Only Jesus Christ can give the Holy Spirit. And so I want to make that very, very clear. These, these virgins, these five foolish virgins, are looking to the wise and they're saying, hey, you know, perhaps you can share some of that oil in your vessels. And by the way, that makes, that makes it a, a good point for me to pause here and just make mention that while they might have had a little bit of oil in their lamp, the, the vessels are separate from the lamp. 
they had an abundance of extra oil with them. These five wise, they had the abundance of the extra oil with them, the five wise, but the five foolish, they didn't take any extra oil. They were just depending on what was in the lamp currently, but during that sleeping delayed time, that oil burnt up and now they need some extra oil. So they're looking to the wise and saying, hey, give us some of that oil. We need some so we can get the rest of the way to meet the bridegroom. And of course, uh, the, 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 the five wise say, no, 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 hey, that's not how it works. If we, don't, if we share ours with you, which again, this is symbolic, then we're not going to have enough for ourselves. That's a beautiful note, my friends, that we need to be seeking Jesus Christ ourselves. We need to be seeking Jesus Christ right now. We can't depend on others to help us get the Holy Spirit. We have to go to Jesus right now on our knees, day and night, ceasing without praying, reading and, 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 and taking in the bread of life each and every day that we might be transformed by the Spirit of God. Brings me to my next question, which I think is a very important one. Notice how in verse 9, the five wise say to the five foolish, no, 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 there's, there's not going to be enough for us. You need to go buy some for yourselves. Go buy from them that sell. Can you buy the Holy Spirit? And as I can imagine Right now at home, everyone is shaking their head going, no, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to seem kind of contradicting and, and, a, and, a, and a little backwards here, but I promise you I'm making a good point. You can buy the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, I'm going, to make, make, I'm going to clarify what I mean by that. Can you buy the Holy Spirit with the worldly monies and the treasures and the things that we might trade as currency for something else? No, 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 no. I want to be very clear. We cannot buy the Holy Spirit with any resource or natural resource that we have. God is not interested in your worldly money, okay? But when we talk about buying the Holy Spirit, my friends, again, we know that the Holy Spirit is a free gift, but it comes at a cost. Now, how do I know that? This is a powerful quote here that I just want to say here. Uh, this actually comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 116. It's actually, she's referring to the, the parable of the pearl of great price. Now, if you know what that parable is about, then you know that the pearl of great price is talking about salvation. It's talking about eternal life. The pearl of great price is the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God in which we receive God's eternal salvation and redemption for all of our sins that we may be granted eternal life. Notice what is written in Christ Object Lessons, page 116, and this same point can be applied to these five foolish virgins going and purchasing or buying the oil of the Spirit. Notice what is said here. It says, in the parable, the pearl is not present, represented as a gift. The merchantman bought it at the price of all that he had. Many question the meaning of this, since Christ is represented in the Scriptures as a gift. He is a gift, but only to those who give, I love this, themselves, soul, body, and spirit to Him without reserve. We are to give ourselves to Christ, to live a life of willing obedience to all His requirements. All that we are, all the talents and capabilities we possess are the Lord's. To be consecrated to His service, we must thus give ourselves wholly to Him. Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, gives Himself to us. We obtain the pearl of great price. And it goes on to say here, salvation is a free gift, and yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without price. The Savior's voice earnestly and lovingly invites us, I counsel thee to buy from me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And of course, she's quoting there Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 and 18. My friends, I want to be very, very clear from this point. Make this very clear. Yes, salvation is a free, free gift, but as we have seen here, it has to be bought. Jesus doesn't want our worldly money, but can you buy the Holy Spirit? You better believe that you can. How do we purchase the Holy Spirit? By giving our whole selves to Him. The only thing we technically own in this lifetime is our sin. And Jesus died for that, and He wants that too. So Jesus is crying from heaven, and He's saying, Hey, I love you. I died for you. 
I want to give you the oil of the Holy Spirit that you may have my righteousness. But in order for me to give this freely to you, I need you to give me all that you have. I need you to give me those sins that I fought and I died for. I need you to give me you who I purchased at the cross, but I will not take it forcibly. I need you to give it to me freely. And so here in this same situation, the five wise are counseling correctly. You need to go buy from them. The only, the only difference is, my friends, does the five wise virgins go and buy from the right source? Jesus says right there in Revelation chapter 3, I counsel you to buy from me. Jesus wants you to buy from him. He has a never-ending love and compassion and mercy and oil of the Spirit that he wants to pour out upon you. He wants to give you his righteousness. But my friends, it comes at a price. Does the five wise, or excuse me, the five foolish virgins go and buy from the right source? We know that they do not, which brings me to my next point. There are two different sources from which you can buy oil. That's right. You have God on one hand who's going to give you the right oil, the holy oil, the holy oil of God's Spirit. But then you have the enemy, Satan himself, who is working hard to make sure that you are deceived and that you receive a counterfeit oil. Now, you may be sitting here saying, oh, you know, Ryan, that's, you know, that's, that's not right. The devil doesn't have a counterfeit oil. The devil's not able to replicate the light of Jesus. Well, let me, uh, this is not actually in the program, so this will not pop up on your screen. But I'm going to give you the reference to this. And I'm going to read this, and I want you to listen very clearly to this quote from Early Writings, page 56. So listen again very clearly, Early Writings, page 56. Notice what is said here. She says, I turn to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. She's looking into the heavenly throne room. And she says, they did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw him look up at the throne and pray. Or I saw them, the little company, look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Did you catch that? Satan has a counterfeit spirit. And I want you to notice, what was in that counterfeit spirit? She says, in it there was light and much power. My friends, the point I want to make here before we go any further is that we got a lot of people in these dark times that are living foolishly, completely deceived into believing that they have the true Holy Spirit of God. And they're walking out there waiting to meet the bridegroom. They've got their lamps. And guess what? In that lamp is an oil. Notice how I'm emphasizing that, an oil. It's not the oil. But they've got some kind of oil in there believing and de they're believing and deceived into believing that this oil is from Jesus. But that oil did not come from Jesus. It's very bright. It's got power, but there's no love, joy, and peace in that kind of oil. And so they're walking around thinking, oh, you know, look at all this bright light that I'm shining. But they're shining the wrong kind of light. Mm. Notice what the Bible continues to say, Matthew 25 Verses 10 through 13. My friends, when you go buy from the wrong source and you get the wrong oil and you think you're going to make it to the kingdom of God, then please, my friends, listen to these last few verses. Powerful indeed. Matthew chapter 25, again, verses 10 through 13. Notice what the Bible says. It says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore. There it is again. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I didn't put it in this particular message for the for sake of time. But if you go read Christ Object Lessons and you read the chapter on the parable of the ten virgins, you will find that it is made very clear that this door that is shut, and when it says that the 
five wise virgins went in with him to the, to the marriage. And then these five foolish virgins come and they're knocking on the door and saying, Lord, let us in. My friends, this is not referring to the literal second coming of Jesus. This is not referring to the literal appearing of Jesus in the clouds. You see, much like Noah, in the days of Noah, did the probation door close when the rains fell or before the rains fell? If you go read your Bibles, you will know that God shut that door and no one was getting in. No one was getting in. Seven days before the rain came. Now I use that point to say that this is not referring to the literal appearing and second coming of Jesus. This door being shut and the, the, the wise saints going into this protective supper of the Lamb and then the five foolish virgins showing up and knocking on the door and saying, Lord, Lord, let us in and only to hear, I'm sorry, I don't know you. This is referring to the close of probation. And my friends, the close of probation comes before Jesus literally appears in the clouds. That's why there's a constant repetitiveness of, this, of this, this phrase, this usage of words by Jesus, by Paul, by Peter, by James, by John. Watch and be ready. Be sober. Be watchful because you don't know the hour of His coming. You don't know when He's going to come. Referencing, you don't know when your end will come. You don't know when the door of probation will close. That's why we have to be ready now. That's why we have to make sure our vessels are full now. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 and 2 really communicates this very much. I love this chapter. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 and 2. This is what the Bible says. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. But notice verse 2, it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. I think that we have clearly seen on display around us in these times. We are living in some of the darkest of times. But my friends, if you think that these are dark times, dark times much darker than these are coming upon us soon. We need to make sure that we have the oil in our vessels, not just in the lamp because the oil can run out of the lamp if you're still sleeping. And when you get up to rise to trim that lamp to make sure that your light is shining bright, my friends, you need to make sure you have an abundance of the real oil. That's why I've always been interested in what Paul has to say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, this text is, was not originally included in my, in my sermon, but it's coming to my mind right now as Paul writes to the people in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe it's verses 1 through 3 there, where Paul says very clearly, he says, do not be deceived by any means, for that day will not come unless there come a falling away first. That day, speaking of the second coming of Jesus. And he says, before Jesus shall come, before the second coming of Jesus shall come, he says, there's going to be a great falling away. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the church. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. And if you look in the original Greek there, it's powerful to consider. When he, said, when he talks about the falling away, the Greek word that's used there is a Greek word pronounced apostasia. Apostasia. It's where we get our English word apostasy. And what does it mean there? That's a prophetic passage, my friends. What is Paul talking about there? He's saying there's coming a time when people in the church, that's right, some, some virgins in the church who have not purchased the right oil, they're trying to run off a false kind of oil. He says there's coming a time when being fully convinced that they know Jesus, that they have a relationship with Jesus, that they're led by the light of Jesus. There's going to come a time when they're going to fall away from Jesus and they're not even going to know it. Right there in that original Greek word, apostasia, it means to defect from the truth, to turn away from the truth. It means to divorce. To divorce who? To divorce Jesus. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the light. And as I'm saying this, there may be someone at home saying, oh, no, that's not even possible. How is it possible that someone can fully believe that they are, that they are in a relationship with Jesus, that they're being led by the light of Jesus, all the while they have divorced themselves from Jesus? My friends, I didn't make it up. That's what the Bible says. And God sends us warning after warning after warning 
and he pleads with us. He says, wake up, check the oil. We need, we, we need to, we need to, some of us have that oil check light that's right there in our face every single day. We need to check the oil. We need to test the oil. We need to make sure, again, test the spirits. That's what, that's what John says. He says, test the spirits, whether they are of God or not. My friends, some of us need to visit the, re revisit the Bible over and over. Some of us are not living by the true word of God. Some of us have that special version tucked away in our library, a version that we often refer to. It's called the SRV. Yeah, you're probably wondering, what in the world is the SRV? Well, it's a version that most of us have, many of us have, and many of us refer to it a little more than others. It's called the self-revised version. Many of us live more off the self-revised version than on the true biblical Word of God. And because we're not living on the true biblical Word of God, and, and we're not really allowing the lamp to function properly, we've allowed our oil to get low. Or, or our oil is not even present to the point to where when we go get an oil change or we go get a refilling of the oil, we're buying from the wrong source. That's what's going on here in Matthew 25. That's what is wrong with the five foolish virgins. My friends, don't miss this point. These are church folk. These are people who go through the motions. They attend church. They return tithe. They might even serve on the church board. They might even be an elder or a deacon in the church. But my friends, you can be an elder. You can be a deacon. You can be a pastor. You can be a scholar. You can be whatever it is that you claim to be and be going through the motions but need an oil change, functioning off a, off a false kind of oil that's putting off a false kind of light. we got to remember the Bible says that the devil himself is an angel of light. He appears as an angel of light. But is that the real, true, righteous light of Jesus? No, it's not. It's not the righteous light of Jesus. It's a false light. And only those who are being led and filled with the true Holy Spirit of God will be able to discern the spirits, as Paul says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I love that text in John chapter 9, verse 4. Where John is quoting Jesus and Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. My friends, I believe the sun has set and we are living in that nighttime and we are fast approaching a greater midnight of despair, greater than any time before. And there's coming a time when none of us are going to be able to work. That's why we must work now. We have the time to work now. We're blessed with the wonderful time that God God has given us to work now we need to make sure that we have enough oil to see us through we are the church the question is who are you where do you fit within God's church are you among the five wise or are you among the five foolish my friends, God has a people, a people whom he is, he's going to rise up in these last days. And they will be those people who will finish his work. I want to read this powerful quote from Councils to the Church, page 240. Councils to the Church, page 240. Notice what inspiration has to say. It said, God has a distinct people, a church on earth second to none, but superior to all in their facilities to teach the truth, to vindicate the law of God. God has divinely appointed agencies, men whom he is leading, men who have borne the heat and burden of the day, who, have, who are cooperating with heavenly instrumentalities to advance the kingdom of Christ in our world. Let all unite with these chosen agents and be found at last among those who have the patience of the saints, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I just want to emphasize that very clearly. God has a distinct people, second to none, who are being led by the true Spirit of God. And you'll notice in that, in that quote there that she highlights a couple of times the keeping of God's commandments, a commandment-keeping people. What did God say to the five foolish virgins when they knocked on the door? Hey, hey, Jesus, Lord, 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 it's us. Let us in. What did he say to them? I'm sorry, I don't know you. 
It's interesting that that is Jesus' last recorded discourse before he would go to the cross. His very first recorded discourse, which would be the famous Sermon on the Mount, right there in Matthew chapter 7. You go look it up. Matthew 7, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And then he says, then I will profess to them, or I would declare to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My friends, a part of the reason why we have many foolish virgins who have this false oil, this false light, we've got people in the church, my friends, who want to believe in Jesus. They want to carry the lamp. They want the, lamp, the, the light of the lamp to show, but they don't want to follow the contents of the lamp. Right here in God's Word, we are told over and over and over that we are to be obedient to God's commandments. Not because they save us, but because He has saved us. And because we are saved by grace, we want to be obedient to Him. But there is a people who are deceived into believing that they know Jesus when they really don't. That they follow the Bible, but at the same time, they do not obey and honor God's commandments. My friends, we need to get back to the Word of God. We need to get back to the truth. Notice what Ephesians chapter 5 verses 8 through 14 says. I love these words here. For you were once or for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. My friends, don't miss this. You cannot expose darkness if you don't have the light. If you don't have the true light of Jesus, you cannot expose darkness if you don't have the oil that gives power to that light. I'm thinking of the, the sanctuary. There's only one light source in the holy place. And the only way that that light can continue to burn is if they made sure that the oil was constantly replenished on a daily basis. Many of us, our, light, our true light has already went out and the devil has snuck in and he's put a little bit of that false oil to deceive you into believing that that light is burning strong when in reality you can shine that light in the darkness all day long, that false light that comes from the devil and it's not going to expose any true darkness because that light itself comes from darkness. We have to make sure and plead to Jesus in these last days, God, fill me with your real oil. Search me, O oh God. Cleanse me, root out any sin, any selfishness, any pride, anything that's there, Lord. Root it out so that I might shine bright for you in these last days. I love the last part of that verse we just read in Ephesians chapter 5. I believe it's verse 14. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Many of us are sleeping, and we need to be awakened. That's why I love Isaiah 60. Right back to our, one of the verses we used earlier. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. Notice what the Bible says. Arise, there it is again, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people mm. but you know we're not going to stop there even though it may not pop up on your screen there I want to read verse 3 because as I, was, as I was preparing this message before I walked in earlier I read verse 3 and I want to just read it to you now notice this the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. You see, when we're filled with the true light of Jesus, the true oil of the Spirit, the lamp can function properly in us and through us. When we allow the lamp to function properly because we've been filled with the real oil of the Spirit, we're being truly guided by God's Spirit, then our light shines so bright that all the Gentiles, all the people of the world, believers and non-believers, they see the light and they go, hey, I want some of that light. 
Where can I get some of that light? We're not going to go up and say, oh, here, let me give you some from my vessel. No, no, no. You need to go to Jesus. He's selling. If you go to Jesus, he's selling. Buy from him because he has counseled us to buy from him the gold tried in the fire so that he can clothe us with, with righteous white garments and that he can, he can put some of that heavenly, beautiful eye salve on our eyes that we can have the spiritual vision that we need in these last days, my friends. Councils to the church, page 345. Got to read it. Here it is. Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy when, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God, that he may seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of peril, God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. Those to whom has been committed a trust so sacred must be spiritualized, elevated, vitalized by the truths they profess to believe, my friends. That's where we are. God has a people. And the devil is at war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why are we here for this time? We're not here by happenstance or some coincidence. God has created you at home right now as you're watching this. He has created you for a purpose. He has created you for a specific agenda to bring glory to him and to let your light shine to this world, this dark world. That's why... Right there in the sixth volume of the Testimonies, page 295, it says, Someone must fulfill the commission of Christ. Someone must carry on the work which He began to do on earth. And the church has been given this privilege, notice this, for this purpose it has been organized. My friends, you are a chosen generation. Right there in 1 Peter 2.9, you're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. God has chose you for this time. Check the oil. Check the oil. Because what Christ needs during this time of midnight despair is He needs a bright, light, midnight delight. That's what He needs. He needs Ryan to be a bright, light, midnight delight. We should be wanting to bring delight to God. We should want our lights to shine bright during this midnight, dark time that we're living in. And my friends, many of us are unaware of what is coming upon us. I want to urge you in these closing moments, surrender your life to Jesus. Check the oil and make sure that you have the right oil in your vessel so that the lamp can function properly and your light can shine bright to the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you're so marvelous. Lord, give us your oil. Pour out upon us the genuine oil of the Spirit. Transform us. Make us new creatures in you, we ask, Lord. Take away our selfishness and our sins. And may we walk in your beautiful light. We ask in Jesus' holy, precious name, amen. Well, praise the Lord, and welcome to our uh, interactive part of camp meeting. As you can see, things are going on here. <laughs> Brother Day, thank you for coming in. What a powerful message. Oh, you, you praise gave. the Lord. And Sister praise Shelley, Lord. you too. And uh, absolutely, and yeah, God has, okay. we felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We feel like we've learned something. Amen. And uh, so, what a, a great part of camp meeting. This, I think Greg and Jill and some of the technical folk decided, let's do this interactive thing. So if you're watching it, you're already registered. You're not uh, seeing it. This is not being shown on the regular 3ABN channels around, but because you've registered and joined us. So what we'd like you to do, Yvonne, can you give them a, maybe you can, uh, if I sure. turn this right side up, sure. you can give them a number. We'd like you to text your questions, your comments. We're going to try to go through them pretty quickly tonight. And so or you can text us at where? 618-228-3975. That's 618-228-3975. So text those questions. We yes, want a bunch of questions. Absolutely. And if you want a question particularly for Shelly, let it just put on there for Shelly. If you want it for Ryan, just for Ryan. We've already have some that's been coming in. 
But uh, what we wanted to do before we go to that in just a minute, we're going to have a prayer. Yes. And I'm going to ask you to lead us in a prayer. Sure. And then we want to just, again, welcome you. Thanks for joining us. This is new to us. I mean, we're used to having a lot of people here. When you guys preach, it's, it's uh, you know, because of COVID, of course, it's a little different, isn't it? And, of sure. course, some of you used to on cameras, you know, but uh, it's still a little different. We're, camp meeting is a time we place is full and people are coming and we're going yeah. out to the campers and the right. motor homes and all this and so that part we miss but we're glad that we can interact with you right here 3 ABN live. Amen. So um, Amen. could you lead us in a word of prayer? Sure, sure. Lord we thank you so very much that you are in our midst right now and we just pray for a continued presence of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to lead and guide and direct us Lord. We thank you and praise you. Be with us and, and help that we will continue to serve you, Lord, with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, remember, text your, text your uh, questions in. Hopefully, maybe it's on the screen. If not, we'll read it again. Uh, every few minutes, we can read it. So we're going to cover as much as we can. We won't be able to get everybody's questions. And we're going to, folks, we're going to do it uh, straight to the point and as short as we can so we can get as many <laughs> Okay. questions coming. So you notice last night there, oh, also when you text, why don't you put where you're from? If you don't want to put your name or even a first name, but at least say what country is really neat or what state that you're from. Because we've seen people literally from around the world who've been participating in this camp meeting. Isn't this great? Oh, I love that. Homecoming. I know. I love it because it's just a little taste of heaven. You know, because mm -hmm. there'll be people from every nation, nation mm -hmm. kindred tongue. And so it's just, you know, it's a little taste of what heaven will be like, even though we're not together right now. Yeah. But it's just, you know, everybody's represented. I love the, I love the idea of camp meeting rather than the, we're calling it homecoming. That's right. better than the home going people talk about, you know, <laughs> they go to funerals now. We know they didn't go anywhere, they're just laying there, but people like to say they're home going. Yeah. It's not a home going, you know, this is a homecoming. So right. we're, we're having a good time. Like a reunion. Okay. Or like a reunion. Yes. Okay. And so we can take a couple minutes, and if one of you want to comment on the other, that's fine. Sure. Okay. And uh, so you got the first one? Yes, this question is for Ryan. My question is, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but have been a Christian since 2009. My pastor states that SDA worship is not necessary and quotes Romans 10:9, stating that God accepts everyone and Saturday worship is not fundamental as it is Old Testament and we're under a new covenant with Jesus Christ. My question is twofold. Am I saved because I'm a Sunday worshiper? And why is the Sabbath so important? Thank you. Mm. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's, that's meaty. A, that's, that's a, a meaty one, that's isn't a bunch. it? That's <laughs> I could talk for an hour on just that one. <laughs> we'll, give you, we'll give you an extra minute or so on that one. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say um, we're not saved by keeping the Sabbath. I want to make that very clear. That's we're good. not saved by keeping the commandments. So anyone who has told you that, you know, you know, keeping the commandments saves you. That's not biblical. We're saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. We're saved by the power of Jesus Christ. Right. So, and I want to make that very, very clear. However, if we are mm -hmm. saved, we will want to obey God and keep That's His right. commandments. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your first question, um, which I think was pertaining to, uh, what was the first part of her uh, question again? Um, I just want to get that right. God accepts everyone and Saturday worship is not fundamental as it's it Old is Testament. Old Testament. Right, absolutely. So, to, the Sabbath is mentioned all throughout the, the, the Bible. I don't know. I don't know who came up with that myth. I just want to make that very clear. Uh, probably the devil himself. I've heard many pastors, and Shelley, I'm sure you've heard this also, who have told you know tell people all the time. Well, you'll find the Sabbath in the Old Testament, but you won't find it in the New Testament. And it's mentioned dozens of times in the New Testament. And so, I want to just make it clear: we're not saved by the keeping of the commandments, but we we are we are judged by our works. And uh, so, I want to make it very clear: why? Is the Sabbath important? Well, it's a part of the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments were not done away with in the Bible. If you go to Exodus chapter 20, right there, you will find the list of the Ten Commandments there, and the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And of course, when you get to the New Testament, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we don't keep the commandments because it will save us. We keep the commandments because we are saved and we love Jesus. And so, you know, again, 
Saturday worship is not going to get you to heaven, but it certainly tells the story of your faith. Your works tell the story of your faith. Again, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of Jesus. But if you are saved by grace, as Paul says in Romans 1, 5, we are saved by the grace for obedience. And so we obey Christ because we love him. Mm. Let me just Absolutely. add to that because we both have similar backgrounds. We, neither, we both grew up in Sunday keeping churches. And when you understand that the commandments were not nailed to the cross, mm -hmm. the beauty of the Sabbath, I'll never forget my first Sabbath. But if you think about it, when God gave those 10 commandments, he'd already saved the Hebrew children. He'd already brought them out of bondage. In uh, Exodus 19, he says, I am the Lord who has drawn you to me like, uh, like an eagle drawing their, uh, uh, their loved ones. It's, it's covenant love language. And the Sabbath is a reminder that God is our redeemer. The mm -hmm. Sabbath is a reminder that God is our creator. The That's Sabbath right. is a reminder, as Exodus 31, 13 says, that God is the one who sanctifies us. And as we come in, I'll never forget my first Sabbath, I finally learned how to release it all to the Lord. It's a beautiful part of the commandments. In Hebrews 8, 8 through 10, God says he's going to write these commandments on our hearts. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amen. All right, next one. Is baptism still required? Is not everyone born after the death of Christ baptized in blood and received the Holy Spirit? If you look at... Oh, go ahead. No, want no, to take that one? Uh, I'm, I'm behind you. Go ahead. All right. If you look at Romans chapter 6, I would just highly recommend you read Romans mm -hmm. chapter 6 because it's it, we are baptized into the death of Christ. Baptism here explains... I've been baptized four times. <laughs> First time because I was 12 years old, age of accountability in a Sunday church. I grew up in the church of Christ. Second time I was 18 because... I thought I didn't do it right the first time. And if I wasn't baptized just right, I wasn't going to be saved. The third time is because I went down to join church and they dunked me before I knew it. But the fourth time <laughs> was after I studied Romans 6 mm -hmm. and understood that baptism is a public confession of Christ. So is it necessary? Yes, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Mm -hmm. Baptism is meaning, I believe you can be saved just like the thief on the cross who was saved and didn't have an opportunity to be baptized. Right. But baptism is a public confession. It is meaning that you are laying down your old life and you are being re resurrected. I mean, it's mm -hmm. your... your buried with Christ, and you're resurrected in the newness of life. But the importance of it is it is a public confession. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ryan, I have one. It says in Matthew 25, 5, says all 10 virgins slumbered and slept. Why are the five wise virgins never criticized for sleeping? Because verse 13 says, watch therefore. To me, sleeping is not watching. Can you please clarify? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think in my sermon, if I remember correctly, I somewhat criticized by saying, I think we've all done a little bit of that. Okay. Uh, you know, sleeping is never a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, with this person, I would absolutely say that there needs to be a little bit of criticism there because sleeping should never be an option. However, it is a reality. And that's why the midnight cry exists. That's why we see Jesus in all his mercy. He still has mercy mm -hmm. on all of those. When you'll find the whole church is asleep for a time before that midnight cry goes out of there. And so you're absolutely right. Whoever sent in this, this uh, question, um, yes, that verse 13 exists to remind us that we are not to sleep. And But I also just want to emphasize the fact that the emphasis of this parable is not so much on the sleeping because there is a reality that even those who have plenty of oil were sleeping for just a time, which they shouldn't have, but they were. And we see the mercy of God dealing with them. But the emphasis of that parable is on the, the five foolish who, did, who lacked the oil. So even though they were sleeping for a time and slumbering as the bridegroom was tarrying, don't forget that, they were sleeping a little bit because the bridegroom was tarrying, not to put the blame on Jesus, but that's just this, the essential uh, truth of the 
matter. But when the midnight cry goes out, they all ro rose to trim their lamps. And we see there that, uh, that when you trim your lamps, that, that fire should still be burning. It may be a little dim, but it still should be burning because you have the oil. And in the, in the main point of that parable is that the five foolish did not have enough oil. So don't miss the point on that. But yes, Amen. we should not be sleeping. We should be awake. We should be watchful because Jesus is coming soon for sure. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have some folks uh, text, texting us, telling us uh, their names and where they're from. All right. If you want to at least De give a first name. Denise from Savannah, Georgia. Um, someone watching in Arkansas. Okay. And Seanette from uh, Guyana in South America. All right. So, yay. We're glad so that you're watching. She's enjoying, they're enjoying the camp meeting. They're loving camp meeting. And, uh, absolutely. Amen. Okay. How about your next question over here? Um, how can I tell if I'm truly converted? Ooh. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3 through 4, that unless you are converted and become like a little child, when we are converted, when we are born again of the Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit of God, we understand that we have to be humble before God mm -hmm. and rely on Him to be totally dependent upon Him because salvation belongs to the Lord. To tell if you're converted, I would say, one, we were created in the image of God. God is love. We're being recreated in the image of his love. We will love others as we will love ourselves. And we will yield to God, laying down our independent authority. That's what surrender is all about, mm -hmm. yielding to his way. If you, uh, you can't be converted unless you're praying, get in the word and know what God wants of you, but know that everything that he calls you to be, he will cause you mm -hmm. to be. Mm. I just want to add to that beautiful, beautiful explanation there. I just want to add a little bit more to that to say that to be truly converted means to be born again. Mm -hmm. And that is a work only that the Holy Spirit can do in us. That's yeah. why Jesus emphasizes, you know, the Holy Spirit aspect in John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus about what it means to be born again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one good clear indicator that you are converted is that you are being led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's working on you. And how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit in your life? You got to do a check for the fruit. There you go. <laughs> if somebody takes me out in the field and says, that's a nice looking apple tree, but there's no apples hanging on that tree. I'm not going to know it's an apple tree until I see the fruit of an apple on it. Okay. Same thing with a Christian. If you want to know that you're truly converted, you're on that path. You will see the fruit of a Christian. You will see the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. You will not be the same person that you were before. Amen. Okay. Here's a question from Fayetteville, Arkansas All right. uh, for Pastor Ryan. Are people who are Sunday keepers not receiving the true Holy Spirit if they don't have the understanding of the Sabbath or those who refuse the truth from the Sabbath. Okay, so there's two parts of that question that stuck out to me. First of all, uh, not necessarily does it mean that someone who is a Sunday keeper is not receiving the Holy Spirit or being led by the Spirit. I, Shelley and I are a prime example of that. Yes. Um, I, was, I was a Sunday keeper for you know, 17 years of my life. And so had it not been for the Holy Spirit working on me to bring me to the knowledge of truth, I wouldn't be where I am today. Mm -hmm. So there are good, wonderful people who are in those Sunday keeping churches that God is, is leading them on a journey and he will reveal that truth in time to them. But the second part of the question, which I believe dealt with the rejection of that truth. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's an important thing. Uh, anyone, whether Sunday keeper or Sabbath keeper, if God sends you light, the, the light of the truth, and you reject that light, light or you reject that truth. Now you're on dangerous ground. And so when we reject the leading guiding power of the Holy Spirit to reveal that truth to us, that we reject it and we don't receive it, then that's where we, that's when we get really, really in trouble. And uh, we could end up looking to have a fearful looking forward to judgment. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. This question is for Shelly. Shelly, how do I practically humble myself before the Lord? Also, please clarify your statement that God needs me emotionally. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I believe because God is love that the reason he created us, you know, when, when a couple has children, do they know that their children could bring them grief and, and a lot of problems and you got to educate them and pay and it costs a lot of money. But God, look, he wanted us emotionally. He needed us because he is love. It's the same reason that other people 
have children. He wanted us as children. How do we humble ourselves? Please get this picture in your mind. God showed it to me and it just changed everything. I saw my father and me holding his hand. He was leading. Here's God. Here's us. We need to be dependent upon God. Pray and ask for his direction. Pray every day and ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, uh, 9 through 13 says that if we keep on asking, how much more does he want to give us the spirit than a parent wants to give their children mm -hmm. good uh, gifts? So to humble ourselves is to allow God to lead. And Romans 8 says that those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Ryan, uh, why is speaking in tongues not acceptable in the Adventist church? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I want to clarify that. Speaking in tongues is accepted in the Adventist church. Let me clarify my statement. Uh, seven, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we believe in the gift of speaking in tongues. That is the biblical gift of speaking in tongues. Um, now, there is a great, powerful, I'm going to say that loosely, uh, false manifestation of speaking in tongues that is received in many, many, many other denominations denominations that I will clarify is not accepted and practiced in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Coming from a Pentecostal background, um, I saw plenty of this false manifestation of the speaking in tongues day in and day out as I was coming and going and attending services. But if you go back to Acts chapter 2 and you read there on the day of Pentecost, there's just a couple of pointers really quickly I want to um, I want to bring out here. On Acts, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples and they received the true gift of speaking in tongues. First of all, you'll notice that if, there's only three examples in the entire Bible where tongues is manifested, where tongue, the, the, the gift of tongues is used or given. And every single time there are, there are more than one nationality present. Okay, And here's another pointer. When you look in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius' family, Acts chapter 19 with the 12 Ephesian disciples, when God gives the true gift of tongues, there is no need for an interpreter. Okay. <laughs> because the gift of interpretation and the gift of tongues are two different gifts. And so how you can always tell if it's a false manifestation of the gift of tongues is if you have somebody stand up and babble off in some incoherent language that no man can understand, and then someone later stands up and starts giving a thus saith the Lord and trying to do it. One reason why, especially here in America, that you won't see a lot of the, the gift of tongues being practiced or used inside the Adventist church is for one, why would God want to give the gift of tongues to an all English English speaking crowd. What's the purpose of the gift of tongues? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 2 shows us that. It's for the purpose of communicating the gospel to other people in their native language. That's why in every single aspect uh, we see the gift of tongues given. It's, it, there's multiple nationalities present and therefore God needed to use the gift of tongues to preach the gospel clearly to those people in their language so they can understand. So if somebody comes into my all English speaking church and they start babbling off in some incoherent language that I don't understand and no one else understands, that's an automatic clue to me that this is not not from God, because if God wanted to get a message to an all English speaking church, he would send it in English the first time because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. So we do accept the true biblical gift of tongues and we know that the true biblical gift of tongues is most likely for sure being used all around the world in scenarios where God needs to commute, where he needs to get across those language barriers and mm -hmm. communicate the gospel in a supernatural way. Amen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's good. Um, this is from Texas says, I just want to say thanks for the beautiful music, so uplifting. For the speakers, wow, wow. I felt Jesus here with me in my little room tonight. What a wonderful, Amen. thrilling, encouraging experience to feel His presence and love. May our Lord bless and keep you all. Amen. Thank you. Praise so the Lord. Much. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, my heart is very numb from stress and worry. What can I do? Please help me understand why. Hmm. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says that if we will keep our eyes focused on the Lord, trusting in Him, He promises to give us perfect peace. First Peter says, you know, cast your cares on the Lord because He cares for you. And He promises us that peace that transcends all understanding. As what I recommend to you, and please listen to this, 
Ask God to give you a divine awareness of his presence. I've been praying that in my own life and I've been experiencing it. It's like I've always known he's inside of me, but now I know he's so real to me. It's like he's with me everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. And no matter what is going on, because if anybody's been following what's been going on with me, for the last 10 months, I've been trying to recuperate from two major surgeries, mm. excruciating pain, but God has given me that peace mm. and God has taught me to give gratitude to him. Boy, I'll tell you, there is the power mm. of praise is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. you have a thankful heart, you're praying and just keeping your eyes focused on him, trusting in him, He'll give you that peace mm. you need. Amen. Okay. Um, this is from Canada. She says, Shelley, you said Christ will remain in human form. So does that mean that God, the Son, lost his omnipresence? You know, that's a good question. I can't wait to find out myself because hmm. he did take, and to me that's kind of what I'm thinking, mm -hmm. is that he hasn't lost his omnipresence in that he sent the Holy Spirit and he, since they are one, he is present everywhere because of the Holy Spirit. But yes, he took our flesh back to heaven. He is sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. What an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing right. sacrifice mm -hmm. that he made for yeah. us. I think that's even more amazing than the fact mm -hmm. that he died on the cross. Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Pastor Ryan, um, this person says, Good evening, dear 3ABM family. My name is Susan. My question for you is, when Jesus opens the door to the five virgins and said, I do not know you, is that because without his blood being on them, they don't have a certain light that he would recognize, so they just look like demons? Hmm. Well, I would say the reason, the main reason why he rejects them entry into, in this case, the kingdom of God is because they have constantly rejected the true oil of the Spirit. And I can't emphasize that enough. That's the whole purpose of that parable. In these last days, Jesus Christ, His blood, He wants His blood to be up on us. But we have to receive that. And, but here's the thing, though. A lot of people want, to, be, they want to, to receive Jesus Christ you know, in mind. They want to receive His blood spiritually upon them, but they don't want to follow Him. And when God sends us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says He will lead and guide us into all truth. He will bring all things to our remembrance. And so what we're seeing here is that, you know, they come and remember He says, I don't know you, right? He says, depart from me, I don't know you. In Matthew chapter 7, we hear those same words. Uh, Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name, but I would profess unto them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. So again, the Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth. The reason why they're not entering into uh, that, that door, into the kingdom of heaven, is because they don't have the real, true, genuine oil. And so actually, to a certain extent, from what I was preaching in my sermon, they get a counterfeit oil, okay, and that counterfeit oil is an oil from another spirit. It's not from the spirit of the Lord. In this case, it would be from the spirit of the enemy. Now, as far as demon possession, I don't want to add to what the word doesn't say. Mm. Uh, but I will say this. If you don't have the true oil of the spirit and then you have some other kind of oil, you don't got the right oil, then you have rejected <laughs> the true Holy Spirit and you're not getting in. So make sure you check the oil and get the right oil in your vessel. All right. Get an oil check. That's right. Get an oil check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, this is from uh, Dante. He says, Hi, Shelley. My name is Dante. I'm 16 years old. This is my first time both hearing and seeing you on video. I've done narrations of several Faith Light devotionals, and I absolutely love your illustrations. This is my first ever 3ABN camp meeting, so bear with me on my question. Uh, what is some advice you can part with us uh, on how we can share the plain Amen. given truths of God. You know, the, the most important communication skill, Dante, and I just welcome you, so excited that you're joining us. But the most important communication skill we have is to listen. So when you are with people, listen and see where they're at, ask leading questions, and just share your testimony. 
All you have to do, it, nobody can argue with your testimony. That's right. And if you share your testimony, what God is doing in your life, mm -hmm. you are planting a seed, and I believe God will water that, and He will get people to ask questions. You can invite people to study the Bible with you or come over to your house for a Vesper service. There's so many ways, but it starts with sharing our testimony. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we may have time for just a couple more uh, questions. Pastor Ryan, what does it mean when you say we need to keep our lamps trimmed and how do we trim and how, how do we keep our lamps trimmed? <laughs> okay, so obviously there's some spiritual language there. Um, I kind of did a little bit of an illustration or talked about an illustration in my sermon. And that is, you know, if, if you're familiar with an oil lamp, you and uh, this goes right along with actually our camp meeting theme, turn up the light, right? <laughs> so if you've ever used an old oil lamp of any kind, it's got a wick, right? And you let that burn, it'll burn, it'll burn. It'll burn bright for a while, but the longer you let it burn, it'll that, that light will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And of course, eventually it'll go out in, in its entirety before you relight that lip, that wick so that the light can be exposed in a bright way. You need to trim the wick, right? You need to trim the lamp. That's what it means by trimming the lamp. When you trim that wick, then the light will shine even brighter. And so that's essentially what Christ is saying in that parable is they all arose to trim their lamps because again, they've received the message. They're about to go out. They've got their lamps, but they need to, they need to trim the lamp. Again, that means to basically be prepared to get up, make sure that their faith is strong and the Lord so that they continue on that path to meet Jesus. And of course, we know the five foolish virgins as they go to trim that wick, they recognize it's not even going to do them any good to trim that, that lamp or to trim that wick because they didn't even have the oil. So again, make sure the oil's there. Make sure the wick is trimmed. Make sure your light is shining bright for Jesus Christ in these last days. Could I add one thing to that? Because sure. I thought, see if you agree with this. Sure. I feel like God trimmed my wick or helped me trim my wick when he asked me in, uh, invited me into full, called me into full-time ministry. To trim your wick, make sure that you're not just taking what mm. somebody says from a pulpit as truth. There you, go. you get in the Bible and check it out yourself. That's right. And even mm. now, today, when I am going to present something, just because I've <laughs> studied it out before, if I'm going to present it, I'll study it out all over again to make sure mm -hmm. that I have it right. So stick with the Word of God, Solo Scriptura. That's right. It's good. Amen. Good. It's good. Maybe, maybe we it's can good. do one more. Yes. Okay. Uh, I've been studying the Bible for, uh, and want to cleanse my past sins and give my life fully to Christ. I've been wanting to get rebaptized, but where I live, the churches are closed. So my question is in Ohio. Mm -hmm. The question is, can a person be saved without getting rebaptized? Or do you have to be saved and baptized in a church? You know, you can do it out in your pond, can't you? Outside yeah. your house or in a bathtub if you had to. But when, when you, go ahead. You're, you're well, breathing. No, you're taking well, a deep breath. I was just going to say, you know, first of all, rebaptism is biblical. And a yes. lot of people think that they can, and I'm just going to, this is very important. If you walk away from Jesus and you've been living in the world and you divorced yourself from Jesus, then you need a remarriage to Jesus. So I would strongly encourage, just for the sake of your faith and the expression for others, to be rebaptized. But does the scripture say you must be rebaptized in order to be saved? I would say that if you have been baptized, you followed in faith, come back to Jesus and pour your heart out to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And he will hear you and he will cleanse you of those sins. But also we have to remember the thief on the cross because he accepted mm -hmm. Christ and Jesus said, hey, I'm telling you today, you are going to be with me in the kingdom mm -hmm. of God. And there are times that people in prison, we've heard of stories of people who are converted, they can't get baptized. God knows and understands if you cannot. Mm -hmm. What's wrong is when you have the opportunity and you refuse to take mm -hmm. the chance. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, well, I can't believe our half hour's <laughs> gone wow. already. Oh, this is but uh, oh, what I'd so like good. to do, uh, Pastor Ryan, I'd like for you to say a special blessing uh, on each and, uh, each and every one of those folk and those Absolutely. that we didn't get to read the questions, all of those watching, mm -hmm. because all of us need to turn up the light. That's you know? right. Yeah. First of all, we accept Jesus. I'm so glad that so many of these folk 
are writing, yes. that are writing us say, hey, you know, I go to a different church. I'm not necessarily Adventist, but you're Christian. Some of you say, I, I, how do I get baptized? It's telling us we have a, a, a lot of diversity right. of, of, of those watching and uh, viewing 3A and joining us here in, the, yes. in this yes. part where we registered to come into the interactive, uh, you know, room. This is great. So yeah. thank you so much. And uh, so I can't wait till tomorrow evening. We're going to be blessed some more. So oh, camp yeah. meeting, uh, we'll go back uh, to, you'll watch us on TV for a bit and then we'll meet you back in the room here. Okay, uh, Pastor Day, would you pray for Absolutely. us? Absolutely, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to first and foremost, Lord, just uplift you and praise your name, thank God, you. because you are worthy. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together to discuss you, Lord. This is what it's mm -hmm. all about. It's all about you. And so, Father, as we have all of these viewers who are watching from around the world, Lord, and God, I just praise, praise you for all those who have written in, texted, you know, chatting and communicating with us, Lord, whether they have a question or a comment or, Lord, it's just such a blessing to know that you still have a people. And so, Lord, I want to ask a special blessing upon these individuals, Lord, all around the world, all those who are watching who yes. may could not have tuned in tonight, Lord, but want to be with us and want to hear this. Lord, bless your people. Give us the oil of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Yeah. Fill up our vessels so that it over, overfills, Lord, and just pours out with oil. And, and may you make our wicks trimmed, our lamps yeah. bright, Lord, in these last days, because we know that Jesus is indeed coming soon. Yeah. So, Father, bless your children. Thank you so much for your never-ending love, grace, and mercy. Yeah. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Okay, Amen. see you tomorrow evening. God bless.